So this is the second part of my contribution, <clears throat> my initial contribution to the debate about Scottish independence in view of the referendum coming up in September 2014. And I feel, as I've said before, a, pre a duty as a philosopher, intellectual and lover of wisdom and <clears throat> a historian and educator to contribute to the debate in as is as rational and holistic and truth-seeking a way as I can. Obviously, everyone involved on all sides of this argument and debate about the referendum are going to have different perspectives and different histories. And in a sense, how we all vote when we come to the referendum day will be determined by that. I'm also a reflection of the cultural influences I've experienced as a child, as a young man, as a, a mature adult. <coughs> and... I can only share what I hope are the fruits of wisdom and some degree of knowledge that I've acquired over the last, uh, you know, decades of, of active work as a teacher and intellectual. Um, and, of course, one might say, well, it's, you know, just, just be quiet, don't bother to speak out, um, you know, it's up for everybody to vote, we should just vote what we want and, and get on with it. But the thing is... Yes, um, and hitherto I've done that, but I also think that, um, you know, it's, it's a very important referendum which could either create an independent Scotland and therefore lead to the breakup of the current United Kingdom and with huge implications for everybody living in all parts of the United Kingdom, um, implications for many people living around the world probably. Um, and therefore, I think one has a duty to, to say, if you think something's coming up that might not be to the advantage of everybody involved, I think one has a duty as a doctor to say, look, if you go down that course, these are the, going to be the likely consequences. Um, so I'm really, I'm just observing, and, and to some extent warning, um, friends, colleagues, and, and fellow countrymen of some of the consequences of certain attitudes, actions, and and so on. Um, the first thing I want to say is that philosophically, um, as people that know me understand, I'm very much wedded to a Jungian perspective, and in my PhD thesis I looked at the notion of transpersonal history. I believe with James Hillman and David Miller and other post-Jungians who I itemized in the appendix of my doctoral thesis that that we all have multiple identities um, as it says in the Gnostic writings associated with, with the early Christian churches um, in, in uh, Thunder the Perfect Mind there's a wonderful sequence which is equivalent to the Taliesin poem the I Am sequence and also Mergen the Druid has the same thing and, and the the sequence unfolds that I am, I am the wind, I am the light, I am the wave, I am the gnosis, I am the light of knowledge. I am also ignorance. I am pure, but I am also the sinner. I am the mother, I am also the whore. You know, there's an acknowledgement here in, in these parallel writings from different sacred scriptures around the world that we, we have this multiple capacity as human beings. Um, the zodiac, which Jung studied ast ast astrologically, is a psychological way of saying that we all have these different archetypes that we can embody. And that's part of the beauty of life. Okay. Um, you know, I, I've been many things in my life, from a street sweeper to a dishwasher to a university lecturer to, you know, a poet to a teacher, etc., etc. And one goes through life and has that richness of experience. And this is, I think, what is part of the Enlightenment journey. Ultimately, I'm, I'm here to address as a philosopher the question of what kind of outcome, what kind of decision on that referendum day is most likely to lead to an Enlightenment journey for the people of Scotland, the people of the United Kingdom, and the people of the world. It's, it's a globally significant um, question. There are other states which are facing the decision of whether to break up and split off. Now, in Spain, the Catalan people are clamouring for a referendum in which they 
in a sense, they were, some of them, some of their vociferous nationalist leaders, would like to split off from the rest of Spain and create an independent country called Catalonia. Now, the argument they have is that that country, Catalonia, would be wealthier than the rest of Spain. Why should they, a wealthy part of Spain, subsidize the poor people of Andalusia or Seville or wherever? And also in the north of Italy, there's a movement to detach northern Italy from the rest of Italy. And the people of Venice recently decided they wanted to go back to being an autonomous republic. And there was, you know, some politicians in Venice have actually said they want a Venice for the Venetians. And in northern Italy, this is associated with a particular political party that campaigns for uh, northern Italy to become an autonomous state and, and completely separate from the rest of Italy. Why should they, the wealthy part of Italy, um, subsidize the South, which is poor and corrupt and run by the Mafia, etc.? Um, now, they're looking to, to the British debate, to Scotland, to the UK, and therefore what we decide to vote in this referendum, in a sense, has, has ethical implications and repercussions. Um, I've been influenced in my work as a philosopher by Kant and his notion of the categorical imperative. We should act in a way that is universalizable. In other words, if we feel that this is a jolly good idea and that the states of Europe and the world generally should, should all begin to split up and go their own separate ways, then obviously we should, we should vote yes in this referendum and we should vote to create a new state called Scotland and split up the UK. And we would then be very happy if the people of Spain do this in Catalonia and Italy and elsewhere. If, on the other hand, we think that actually, you know, actually that's probably not the right way to go. I mean, I personally love Spain. I've just been recently to a conference in Cordoba. I, I, I know Spain quite well. I have a great respect for Spanish philosophy and culture and religion. And, you know, particularly in the old days of the Moorish influence of the South, Ibn Arabi is one of my great heroes and, and mentors from the past as a great Sufi. And, um, but so are, you know, the, the writers of the Zohar, which were produced in Spain by the great Jewish mystics and great Christian mystics like Raymond Lull and St. John of the Cross and so on. Out of that incredibly complex interaction between the different cultures and religions of Spain, we got, we got a kind of premonition of the Enlightenment in Europe as a whole. And some people may not know, but Abelard, the founder of the University of Paris, was in touch with people in Andalusia and was striving towards universal knowledge. What people like Ibn Rushd, Ibn Arabi, and Raymond Lullan people were doing was, was looking for absolute unity behind divergence. They were seeking for a metaphysical transcendental unity, as Fritjof Schuon calls it, which transcends the, the, the material disunion that we see. And as a philosopher and, and, and scholar of religions, I've also been searching, searching for that intimation of unity. And since discovering the works of Fritjof Schuon and Ibn Arabi and so on many, many years ago, I've always made that my life's path. And that is what I regard as the work of the peace philosopher. As coordinator of philosophers of peace throughout the whole of Europe, my duty is to say to these different countries, you know, what path can you follow? What, what kind of thinking is going to be most conducive to peace, not just in your own country, but in the whole continent? And when I look at countries that are falling apart, like in the Ukraine, um, I would have to say, look, this splitting up of countries is not really working. What we're seeing in Ukraine is a horrendous, um, tragic breakup and civil war between, between people that want one thing and people that want another. And they can't agree to, you know, to, to deal with things democratically and, and through the ballot box. And, you know, they're taking, they're, 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 they're arming themselves and they're fighting as I speak in the fields of Ukraine. And now an international jetliner has been downed as, as a collateral damage from this tragic conflict. Um, you know, my own view as another reason against the breakup of nations. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking issue with Leopold Kaur, who's worked the breakup of nations, in a sense started the ball rolling. What Kaur said way back, decades ago, was that no, nations are too big, it's great to break them up. We should, we should uh, you know, everybody have their own little nation state. 
and this will solve the problems of the world. Um, Rousseau had a similar kind of idea. He, he, he dreamt that if every little country had, had a small polis going back to the kind of size of Athens or part Sparta, they could all live in harmony. Um, and so he wanted to deconstruct the nation state. I think cause ideas are, are, you know, it, um, fundamentally maybe long, long, long term appropriate, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, and one of the problems one has is, is once you start going down that route of, of, of breaking up the nation states, say Italy, um, you know, where do you stop? Do you, do you go back to every city state becoming a, an independent republic like Florence or, or Venice or Milan, as it was in the Renaissance times? Um, the other argument I find difficult about this is, is the people that want to break away usually do so because they think they're going to be richer. So the people of Catalan region of Spain want to break away from Spain because they'll have a richer state and they'll live in a more comfortable quality of life, and, and the people in northern Italy the same. I can only point out as an ethicist, a philosopher, that, that that's, you know, the wrong kind of decision to be making and to, to then um, jeopardize the well-being of all the citizens you leave behind in the poorer state. And one thing I find, as I've said before, if, if that's part of the argument for Scottish independence, if people are being told or honestly believe that Scotland will become much richer per capita once it's broken away from the UK, well then so be it, make that argument, say that outright, and it would for me be an argument not to break away. If, if that is what people genuinely believe, and, and they want to go down that route of what I regard as selfishness, you know, I don't want to break up the UK and, and go off and live in a richer part, leaving the, the poorer people of the slums of England and Wales and Northern Ireland to kind of muddle on. Um, to me, it's a selfish argument, and, and I don't accept it either in the UK context or in Spain or Italy or any other country that puts forward that argument. Every country has richer and poorer bits. The whole point of having a country is that is like having a family. You know, some kids do well, go to university, get great jobs. Some kids don't. But if you're a good family, you care for each other. Love transcends that, you know. And, and so I think it's not a good argument. On the contrary, what I think is, is the correct argument here is, going back to my idea of multiple identities, every, every person, to me, where I'm coming from, is born a divine image of the Creator. As a kind of Christian Kabbalist, or Sufi, or whatever you want to call it, every tradition, Buddhism, and so on, says, we're all made in the image of God. We have that potential for the wholeness within us all. Ultimately, the country I belong to is the kingdom of God, as I believe we all do. That's where we'll be judged, and that's our true home. You know, and that takes many forms. You can be a Muslim, or a Jew, or a Christian, or a Buddhist, or a Druid, or a Hindu, and, and be a member of the kingdom of God. That's how I see it. Because within us all, there is that Atman, there is that fullness potential of wholeness. But we choose to incarnate in different lives. I believe in incarnation, like all Druids and, and mystics that I've ever met do. Um, and I think that the scientific and empirical evidence shows that, you know, reincarnation actually is a fact. Um, so we, we, we live many lives in, in different cultures, different countries, different language systems, different philosophical traditions, to have those rich experiences. And that's part of the beauty of life. That's, that's why this planet is such a wonderful place. So I'm singing in praise of, of, of multiple identities. And the logic that I propose is, is and and. It's a version of Nagarjuna's logic, which is the double negative, that simplistic realities that present themselves are actually illusory. Life is not simple. There are not simple black and white issues. If the, if the universe was intended to be black and white, we wouldn't see in colour. We wouldn't see in shades of grey and shades of rainbow. It's the complexity that makes life interesting. I've never yet met a human being. I've taught hundreds, probably thousands of students in my time as a teacher so far. I've never met a single one that isn't an extremely complex person with a whole bundle of conflicting needs, interests, ideas, opinions, and so on. And, and they can change over time. I've, I've taught kids from, you know, age 11 up to 18, and, and they evolve, 
and then young adults who go on to university again. Ideas evolve, they're in flux. And so, you know, and, and somebody in, in, in a normal life career will have many different choices. They'll, they'll be interested in sport at one point in their lives, or art, or the natural sciences, or they'll take time out and, and fall in love and have a family and, and get into parenting, or, you know, they'll become a professional and so on. And they might live in different parts of, of, of a country or different parts of the world. Nowadays, with travel and transport, we can all move around and, you know, experience different lifestyles and different adventures. This is all healthy, where I'm coming from. Um, this, this, this multiple identity um, is, is part of our birthright as human beings. Now, one of the reasons I like the UK, and in a sense do want to keep it together, having thought about this long and hard, is because of the complexity of the multiple identities of our wonderful little microcosm of the planet. You know, I, as I said previously, but I'll repeat, I, I know the UK pretty well. I've travelled all over it. Um, and I love all parts of it. I've spent a lot of time in Cornwall, and I know it quite well. I have a great affinity to the Cornish traditions. Um, I spent a lot of time in London, which I know very well and love. Everybody in their life should spend some time in the metropolis. Um, I, I've come to love Scotland, which I know fairly well now. I know Glasgow and Edinburgh pretty well, and different parts of Scotland. I'm still learning new things. You know, there's parts of Scotland I don't know. Um, I knew, I know the Isle of Arran and, and, and Mull and Iona and, and um, the East Coast and St Andrews and everywhere I've been in Scotland I, I've, I love. You know, it's an incredible country. Um, I, I've noticed shades of difference. You know, Inverness and around there there's a very strong sense of the Pictish culture, the Pictish tradition. If you go around the museum in Inverness you see the ancient heritage of the Pictish kingdoms with their matriarchal cultures which were very interesting, um, seemed to be related to the ancient Britonic um, uh, Welsh-speaking peoples who were living down in Strathclyde. Um, and it's interesting that then in Edinburgh and that part of the world there, there was a strong connection with Northumbria and it was a Northumbrian king that seems to have actually founded Edinburgh and given its name, King Edwin. And Scots, the lowland dialect of, of Scotland is is actually a variety of Anglo-Saxon. I mean, it's 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 closer in many ways to old Anglo-Saxon than than modern English is. There are lots of words in Scots that are actually direct derivatives of Anglo-Saxon from Northumbrian dialect. So, you know, it's a patchwork our nation, and I haven't yet made it to Shetland and Orkney. I really want to. I I mean, obviously, there's more Viking influence there, and and I have a lot of time for the the best aspects of Viking culture, the runic wisdom that they stand for, not the rapine and violence that unfortunately they practiced. Um, so, <clears throat> but I've also lived in Wales for many years and, and love Wales and, um, you know, uh, feel very, very in harmony with the, the druidic traditions of Wales. Um, and then I know the south coast very well. I went to school in Brighton and I know Sussex and, and you know, all the way over to Wessex and, and Winchester and Wiltshire. I've taught in Wiltshire and Bristol, where I went to university. The West Country, the King of Wessex is, is you know, uh, something I also know well. And the old kings of Wessex that are buried in Winchester Cathedral. Magnificent um, heritage there, if people haven't been. And also the, the, the heritage of King Alfred. Um, now, who was, I think, you know, the greatest king that, that ever lived in the British Isles in, in recorded history that we know about. Um, and he understood the importance of knowledge and culture and education, but also spirituality. Um, so <clears throat> I think where I'm coming from as a, as a philosopher is this um, recognition that we humans are, are multiple, we have these multiple identities, we... And, and the, the trick is to find a harmony between them all. The trick is to ensure that we don't literally break down and become schizophrenic. In mental illness, you know, you have multiple identities that no longer can harmonize with one another. And, and you start hearing voices or whatever. And, and different parts of the personality split off from each other. This is, this is a tragic 
phenomenon that happens to many people. As a philosopher of psychology and, and, and inner peace, what I think the Jungian perspective can contribute is the recognition that, that intelligence, wisdom, is about balancing the center of these multiplicities and finding a harmony between them. And I think that this has political implications. Um, <clears throat> when Jung was asked by UNESCO to provide a forum for debate about how to solve the nuclear arms issue, he basically said, well, it, it has to be done on an individual basis. We have to get rid of the desire for violence and aggression. We have to integrate the shadow, the enemy. We have to see that we're all part of a greater, bigger picture here. And, and I would say that this struggle for wholeness and the vision of wholeness is still not yet achieved. The tragedy of the Ukraine situation, as I've said in, in uh, a talk I did for the Centre for Peace Policy Research, is that people in Ukraine are being presented very simplistic choices. You're either with the Russian culture, you regard yourself as a Russian Ukrainian, in which case you're going to fight the, with them, that separatist movement, or you're with the pro-European <coughs> Ukrainians, and in which case you're going to fight with them. And these two sides are now slogging it out on a battlefield. This is such a simplistic and false logic. You know, the, the true Ukrainian culture and, and, and intellectual and, and historical tradition is much more rich and much more multidimensional. I mean, one of the greatest Kabbalists, um, Nachman of Bratislav, came from the Ukraine. He was one of the greatest philosophers of religion that's probably ever walked on the planet. Uh, talked about interdimensionality and, and the coexistence of spheres of being, and how the human, the, 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 you know, he tried to explain in detail what it means to be existing in the image of God, which according to the Kabbalah we all do. And that means we have access to that multidimensionality. In moments of deep prayer and meditation, we can transcend the, the horizontal level of being and transcend to the vertical level. And, you know, of, of that school of the Kapala, there are techniques of meditation that enable you to reach those sublime states. But then you come back in and you do the washing up and you, you know, you water the, the flowers. Um, and that's an important dimension too. That's, that's the Sephiroth of Malkut, the kingdom, the material world. We all exist at different levels in, in our lives. We explore different, different Sephiroth on the tree of life, so to speak. And this multiple identity is, is what it means to be made, I think, in the image of God, or the gods. Because, you know, if, if we're going to look at this through the lens of the debate between monotheism and paganism, the polytheistic wisdom was that, well, why not say that these different archetypes are actually different deities, as it were? You know, there's Venus, who's a particular kind of experience we can all be inspired by, the physical love. But then there's Athena, whose wisdom, the intellectual love, the, the, the blue stocking, you know, whose idea of a good night out is to spend, spend time in the library. And we can all do these things at different times, just as there's Apollo or Dionysus. In, in the male archetype. So, how does what's all this got to do with the debate on Scottish independence? Well, um, what I'm what I'm trying to argue, what I'm what I've muddled through in my thinking, and I hope I don't know if this is of value to anybody, but I think the beauty of a nation like the UK, and I would say also like Spain or France or Germany, is that. There are so many parts and regions, so many different dialects and nuances, um, that you never get bored. And yet there is a harmony that remains between them. Um, I mean, Brittany I know and, and, and love well. I know France very well. I speak French. I was born in uh, Montreal, the second biggest French-speaking city in the world. I speak, I, I've been in Paris many, many times. Virtually grew up in France in the holidays. My mother was a French teacher and a Francophile. And I've travelled in the Loire Valley, Brittany, Normandy, and the South, and I know Auvergne, Clermont-Ferrand, and Paris, and so on. Now, wherever you go in France, there's a great sense of regionalism. Every, every bit of the country is different. Like Auvergne is, is unbelievable, the Puy de Dome around there, you know. Um, it has a very strong identity. It's where Vercingetorix led the final attempt at Druid resistance to the Roman invasion of Gaul under Caesar. 
and it's a, it's got a deep history there. It's totally different to say Paris or the Deep South or Provence um, or Côte d'Azur or Brittany. What's what's the magic of of France as a whole is that they stay together in harmony. There's there's a sense of loyalty to the whole that is bigger than the sum of the parts. Um, is that wrong? Is is that kind of pride in one's culture something that one should be ashamed of? Um, I think I think one should moderate that pride in one's culture with the wisdom that Mazzini had, the Italian patriot, who said a nation is only a stopping station on the road to, you know, peace, on the road to a perfect world. Nationalism isn't the answer, it's a means to, to achieve certain goals, which would include in Mazzini's idea and the ideals of these 19th century Italian patriots, um, you know, the ideal of, of of perfect brotherhood, fraternity, sisterhood, peace, harmony, and so on. They wanted the harmony of, of the nation on a bigger picture. And this is the understanding of the United Nations. This is why the United Nations was, was brought into being, to advance that, that goal. The question, therefore, before us is, is you know, has the U is the UK's balance sheet in this project so bad that we should simply bring it down, that we should vote against it, um, and self-destruct as a nation, and effectively abolish the UK by taking Scotland out of it. Um, I mean, karmically, yes, I can see things that, that it would be karmically appropriate. The UK has done some terrible things in its name, like I would say the invasion of Iraq in 2003 by a Scottish Prime Minister and a Scottish Cabinet, largely, Gordon Brown and co, was, was, a, was a crime, a war crime. Um, there was no justification for the invasion of Iraq, and it was done under false pretenses. And so karmically you could say, well, we, our country, the UK, was a, was a participant in destroying Iraq, and now look at it, it's falling apart into civil war. So karmically, it's absolutely appropriate that one of the consequences should be the destruction and break-up of the United Kingdom. That, that's a kind of a justice uh, that, that the divine orders of karma behind the scenes would, would kind of see as appropriate. Um, but, you know, the question is, how would that serve even the people of Iraq? If the UK were to be broken up and Scotland becomes totally independent and we end up with decades and, and decades of legal wrangling and bickering and we all become poor as a result, which is what I suspect would happen, and, um, you know, the, the, um, the consequences are that, that just the UK becomes a muddle of contending voices. Um, and and falls apart in a kind of chaos and confusion. Um, I don't see that that's actually going to help the people of Iraq. You could say, well, no, it would, because Scotland would become a great voice for peace, and Scotland would 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 have ambassadors for peace, and it would have a, a, a peace member in its cabinet, and it would pursue policies, and by getting rid of nuclear weapons from its soil, it would be showing the world that this is a route that can be done and it would be flying a signal for peace around the world. It could have, you know, a, a, an international voice for peace. Um, if I thought that were genuinely going to happen, and could happen, then I think that is one of the strongest arguments, I've said, for voting with the Yes campaign. The trouble is that the, the you know, I do have certain reservations about that, and I'm, I'm certainly not convinced, I've seen no evidence from, from Scottish nationalists I have met, and from debates and rhetoric that I've listened to, that that is other than, than a kind of rhetorical ploy. And, you know, um, I also take the view that what we should be doing as a country as a whole is adopting that Pacific intent, and that we should be having a Ministry of Peace in the United Kingdom government, that we should be adopting a peace policy, um, you know, as a country as a whole. <clears throat> and that would be far more effective if the UK as a whole became a voice of peace than if just Scotland did. Um, so, now, 
By keeping the UK together, by celebrating the multiple identities we share as a culture, by by celebrating all the different dialects of, of, of languages that we speak, from Welsh to Cornish to the different dialects of English, of East Anglia, the old language of, of you know, the farming stock of Sussex, and, and the incredible richness of all the folk song traditions that we have, all the way from John of Groats down to Land's End. Um, what, what I've been trying to do as a philosopher and historian is, is to find the peace voice within all that. And I think every part of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland and, um, you know, the Channel Islands and so on, um, and, and the Isle of Man, they all have a unique voice and a contribution to make for peace. I think if we work together um, and celebrate our, our, our many identities, we're going to be more likely to, to, to create a vehicle for that to be possible than what I find difficult is, is forcing us back into kind of monochrome uh, boxes whereby, you know, you, you, your, your identity becomes less than the wholeness that, um, you know, that, that one is born with as a birthright. And if people are now told, let's say the Scottish independence vote goes to create a separate state of Scotland, and people throughout the whole country of the UK are going to have to decide where they want to live. You know, I've known dozens, hundreds of Scottish people living in England, teaching, working as academics. I was taught Kantian philosophy at the University of Bristol by a great Scottish philosopher. Um, you know, a lot of these people might want to go back to Scotland and, and live and settle there, you know, and, and help birth their new country. Um, a lot of English people, I've met a lot of English people living in Scotland who are happy here, um, doing whatever professional work. They might then want to go back and live in England and, and, and no longer feel welcome in Scotland. Um, you know, there's, there'd be a lot of soul searching and the question of, you know, who's, which passport would you have? Would you have a, presumably the new state of Scotland would have a Scottish passport. Well, would you you know, what would be the criteria for getting that? Would you want one? Would you want to get rid of your United Kingdom passport? Or, in my case, I have a Canadian passport as a dual citizen. Um, would I be forced to choose between a Scottish and a Canadian passport, for example? You know, no, I think this is, personally, <laughs> I, I, I think that by keeping our UK-wide identity, and, and I don't think it's a mere nationalist uh, position I'm taking here. I think the UK is transnational. It's a conglomeration of different nations. You know, the people of England, people of different regions, like the Yorkshire people are very different to the people of Suffolk or Sussex or Kent or Wiltshire. Um, and in the old times past, they used to have their own kingdom separately, the seven kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxons. And the tribes of Wales, again, had their own separate kingdoms, to Hoybath or David these different regions, Gwynedd and so on, were all under their own tribal leaders and elders. Eventually, a Brett Walder, a ruler of the whole country, was, was emerged into being as a, as a, as a post. And in, in Scotland too, north of the border, north of Hadrian's Wall, there was a diversity of tribes and, and peoples who must have thought of themselves as different to the other lot. And yet eventually they, they came to um, a sense of unity under, under one particular crown, one, one king. Although that was always problematic, um, as it was in England. I mean, the search for unity has been littered with blood, tragically. And things like the Wars of the Roses and, and the Scottish equivalents, you know, the... the um, the, the, you just have to go around Stirling Castle to see the um, something of the troubled and, and, and bloody history of of Scotland. So, anyway, I can only comment and, and offer perspectives from a philosophical perspective. I'm not a politician. I have no interest in party politics. Um, I, I have views. I have, um, and they've changed over time. They're still ev evolving. I think. When there's life, there's change, as the Taoists would say. Um, 
But these comments are intended simply philosophical comments on, and and I think you know the first point I've made is that we can have multiple identities. Now I think that's also true in religious terms. I'm primarily a philosopher of religion and have taught religious studies and comparative philosophy and global philosophy for many years. And I run an institute in Argyle here of peace studies and global philosophy and. What this is about is about looking at all the contrasting worldviews that exist on the planet, say Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and so on, and comparing and contrasting and finding the universal values within them. What interests me is not the differences between them, although one has to study that in depth, but it's where they merge into unity. What interests me in, in, in the study of comparative philosophy is finding the points of commonality and and common sharing. I mean, in, 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 in a love affair, it's, the, it's where you overlap. It's where you literally touch that is the, you know, the, the place where ecstasy happens. And what I'm interested in as a philosopher is where different systems of thought have actually touched. For instance, in, in the Islamic tradition, there are many sources for Islam, which most people don't realize, such as Zoroastrianism, which certainly inspired and had a lot to do with the birth of Islam, such as Manichaeanism, and many people don't realize it was Mani who first came up with this notion of a succession of prophets, he being one, Buddha being one, Christ being one, Zoroaster being one. You know, that same idea was brought into Islam right from the very beginning. <clears throat> um, people don't realize that Zoroastrianism also influenced the Buddhist Mahayana tradition with the idea of the bodhisattva, the, the, the kind of halo-bedecked saint who works ceaselessly for the liberation of beings from suffering, like Kuan Yin. The Zoroastrians had, had this belief that, that these, these prophetic geniuses throughout history, like Zoroaster, and there's a whole lineage chain of them, that's what they're doing. They're working to save mankind from Araman, from ignorance, from evil and suffering. <coughs> so... And, and these, inspired, these ideas also inspired the birth of Christianity, with, with the Magi coming from, from the East to the birth of baby Jesus and, and bringing these gifts. Now, it's a symbolic thing in the Gospel of Matthew, that, that Christ was welcomed into the circle of initiates by the wisdom keepers of the East. Now, there are different possible explanations for that, and I've gone into that in detail in my commentary on the New Testament. But above all, it's, it's a signal that Christ was there as a Messiah figure, as a seashant for mankind as a whole. Not just for his tribe, not just for the people of Galilee, not just for the people of, of Judah, not even just for the people of Israel. But, but he was reaching out to something universal for all mankind, of significance for all mankind. Now it's that universalism that also interests me. And that's why and where and, and where from I'm, I'm trying to comment on this debate, which I think is framed in too narrow and unsubtle a logic. It's either you're for Scottish nationalism or you're for, or you're against it. You know, it's, uh, the problem with politics is it, I think, is just a dumbed down version of, of thought. Um, and so, I can only comment on this from a philosophical perspective. So the first, I, I want to kind of go through and say how I see it from each of these positions, from, from as much as I can fathom. Um, and I'm, I'm showing this in humility. I don't know. If you have a better argument or you think differently, and you can evidence that and prove me wrong, I'll sit at your feet. Um, for the first tradition I want to talk about is the Buddhist tradition. Now... Buddhism is a religion I've been very interested in for many, many years, and took initiation in, and have studied um, the idea of the, the Mahayana tradition, the Bodhisattva tradition, inspired me um, at my time of studies in the late 70s at the University of Bristol. Now what Buddhism teaches is that, is that suffering is caused by greed, and that the antidote to suffering is, is surrender, detachment, non-greed, not grasping. And instead allowing consciousness to, to find equanimity and peace within itself. 
um, not interfering, not not going out and grasping. Now, it seems to me, from a Buddhist perspective, and, and there are many Buddhists, well, a few Buddhists I've met in Scotland, Sami Ling is one of the great Buddhist centres of Europe, and was founded by Akron Rinpoche and Chogyam Trungpa, and I was very influenced by Chogyam Trungpa back in the 70s, his wonderful book, Cunning Through Spiritual Materialism. And I think that that is a jewel um, we have at Sami Ling, and also Holy Island, which is a retreat centre attached to it, where I've spoken. One of my students was the director of the retreat centre there, Shirley Touré. Now, from a Buddhist perspective, the question we have to ask politically is how can, what, what system is going to be most conducive to happiness, well-being and enlightenment? And what system, what choices we might take that would lead to most unhappiness and suffering? And then I think from a Buddhist perspective, one would, one would take the choice that leads to maximal enlightenment. And Buddhists don't really do politics on the whole, but they do, they do have a, a view. They can comment on politics, just as Buddha did himself. And he renounced specifically becoming an outer king in order to become an inner king of Dharma and righteousness. From a Buddhist perspective, I think, I mean, I've known Buddhists throughout the United Kingdom. Um, <clears throat> I lived very close to Chithurst Monastery in Sussex at one point, um, and my institute was based in, in West Sussex for a year. Um, I've spent time on retreat in, in Buddhist monasteries in different parts of, of the country, in Cumbria at Manjushri Institute when I was in my early 20s. I spent time on retreat there. Um, for several months, and I've studied, I, I, I'm a member of the Buddhist Society, which was based in, in London, near um, Victoria Station, founded by Christmas Humphreys, who I knew, and who was a great man, who brought Zen Buddhism, really, to, to Britain. Um, and I've used the library uh, of the Buddhist Society, which was a branch of the Theosophical Society, in London there, and meditated there. I've, I've sat in meditation in many Buddhist centers around the country and, and have a profound love and respect for the teachings of, of Buddha and the Dharma. I'm, I think that a Buddhist perspective on politics would be you choose that which is most conducive to harmony, you, can, you choose that which is most conducive to enlightenment and I think, I think Buddhists on the whole are somewhat suspicious of nationalism and I think where Buddhists dabble in nationalism, there are problems. We're seeing this a bit in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, with the tragedy of, of the war between the Buddhist Sinhalese and the Tamils, who are largely Hindu. If I was in Sri Lanka, I, I wouldn't be happy with a, a narrow Buddhist nationalism. I'd be most uncomfortable. Um, I have dear friends in Kandy who are Muslims from Sri Lanka and help with the Commonwealth Interfaith Network, uh, which I run. And... You know, they, they are, they've been a bit shocked at the behaviour of some of these Buddhists, um, you know, claiming to be representatives of the Dharma, and yet, and yet preaching virulent hatred against the Tamils and, and the Hindus of, of Sri Lanka. So I think genuine Buddhists would be very wary of nationalism in, in that violent kind of... Uh, because it tends to polarise people. What's happened in Sri Lanka is a tragedy. Um, it used to be a kind of utopian place, a, a paradise island. And, and then the nationalist tradition on both the Tamil and the Sinhalese centre has polarised everything and made a huge war in which thousands, thousands of people have died, some horrendously. And I organised a meeting in the House of Lords trying to prevent that conflict some years ago. Um, and, and the, the problem has not gone away, you know. So I think, I think Buddhists need to rethink their identity. Um, we're seeing this problem also in, in Burma um, and Thailand. In, in Burma, there's, there's, there's a kind of fear of the Islamic uh, subcultures of, of Burma. And some Buddhists are, again, turning violently on, on their Muslim neighbours and massacres and, and pogroms and so on, um, which is, again, very anti-Buddhist, to my mind. A true Buddhist wouldn't, wouldn't engage in that kind of nationalist violence. In Thailand, which is, I've always thought of as one of the most beautiful countries in the world, 
and most peaceful, and many people who've been there have always said that. Yet we've seen unrest and violence and demonstrations. I met a, a very important Buddhist thinker and scholar at a conference in Jaipur in January who told me a lot about what was going on behind the scenes in Thailand among different factions and, you know, these different parties and, and allegations of corruption and so on. Um, uh, what he's trying to do is set up a centre for the study of non-violence within um, Thailand, and I wish him luck with that. It seems to me, and Sulak Shivaraksha, who I've met, a great Buddhist activist for peace, um, also from Thailand, talks about engaged Buddhism. There's no point hiding your enlightenment under a bushel. You have to be engaged in the world, but in a non-violent way, simply as a teacher. Buddha himself went from place to place and taught. You can listen or not. Um, and it's the same, really, the, the inspiration I received from, from people like Gary Snyder, who I met, and Buddhists from California um, in the late 70s when I was first beginning my spiritual journey. I think from that perspective, you, you, you don't abandon politics, but you do it from a peaceful, a loving, and a compassionate way. At that time, it was the Vietnam War that were, was upsetting people. This, this polarization between communism or anti-communism that, that, that saw the tragedy of Vietnam, a great Buddhist nation going up in flames. Napalm dropped from the sky and, and the Viet Cong and so on. I would have said, no, I'm not going to fight. I'm, not, I'm neither communist nor anti-communist. I'm a Nagarjunist. I do neither this nor that. I don't want to be engaged in this level of violence. I'm working on enlightenment, thank you. You can join me if you want, and I strongly recommend it. Or you can carry on with your vicious little infightings. And a great Christian theologian I respect, Thomas Merton, went to a conference in Thailand, and he was very involved in dialogue between Buddhists and, and Christians, and he believed that ultimately Christians should be saying the same thing. When we don't want to engage in your war. What we want is the kingdom of God, which transcends that, that, that shallow polarization, which leads to violence. And I'm afraid that I think this is my, this is from a Buddhist perspective, how I see this vote on, on are you with the Scottish nationalists or are, are you against them? I'm with Nagarjuna on this. I'm neither with them nor am I against them. What I want is enlightenment. And the way I will vote, and I, th I would counsel people to, is, is to vote in the way that you think will bring the most enlightenment and happiness to all the people of the country and not just to the people of Scotland. I think we have a duty. I mean, my, my relatives are scattered throughout the United Kingdom. You know, this is a slightly different framework, maybe, to some people, but I, I believe that as citizens of the United Kingdom, we've grown up in this country, we've benefited from its, its governance system, its democratic system, its social security, its, its civilised politics, its, um, its media, and so on and so on. For all its ills, it's our home. It's, it, this is what I feel. And, and to destroy it, to, to tear it apart in the name of a nationalist, tradition, um, this or that nationalism, you know, you can be a Cornish nationalist or a Welsh nationalist or a, I suppose you could be an East Anglian nationalist or a, uh, different varieties of Scottish nationalist or an Irish nationalist and you can, you know, you can agitate to destroy the United Kingdom from that perspective. From a Buddhist perspective I think there has to be some caution. Um, I, think, I think it's an idle nationalism and Reverence for one's homeland is some, something different. Respect for one's mother and one's motherland is, is a deep um, act of piety, and it's, it's, it comes from love. <clears throat> but, but the Id idolization of, of a particular nation-state um, at, at the expense of others, I think, is a dangerous path. Um, and... So, from a Buddhist perspective, I think there's also the practical implications of, of you know, I, I want to be able to be a member of the Buddhist society uh, in this country, <laughs> and, and to be able to go and sit with my Dharma colleagues in Samiling, or monasteries in Northumbria, or Northern Ireland, and, and talk about ultimate truth, and learn from them. 
I also want to give a home to refugees who are forced out of countries that are in turmoil, like Tibet, which has been brutally oppressed by China for many decades. And, you know, I admire the fact that Prince Charles will meet the Dalai Lama, and there's a lot of injustice going on in Tibet. I want the United Kingdom to be able to add its voice to the world, to say, look after and respect the rights of Tibetan peoples and other oppressed um, cultures such as the Palestinians and so on. And I mean as a Buddhist society member I get the Buddhist um, Middle Way magazine which carried an interesting article about Buddhist chaplains in the army. <coughs> the British army has now for the first time appointed a Buddhist chaplain because there's quite a few Buddhists actually serving in the army, not least the Gurkhas. And their spiritual needs were not really being take, taken care of. Um, the Buddhist view on violence and war is that you, you don't engage in it, certainly not if you're a monk. If you're a lay person, you only engage in it when it's a lawful, um, you know, just conflict, and you weigh this very, very carefully. And, and you use minimum force, and, and essentially you're a kind of peacekeeping operative. And ideally, you work for peace and disarmament and the ending of war globally, but most importantly, the ending of the causes of war. What you don't do, I think, is work for causes and, and factions which might eventually lead to and create actual fresh wars on the planet. And this, to me, is one of the most strong arguments against the Scottish nationalist position of, of breaking up the United Kingdom. You know, the United Kingdom is a precious gift that has prevented wars between the different parts of this country for many centuries. Um, and prior to its existence, when we had an independent kingdom of Scotland, independent kingdom of England, Wales, and so on, there, were, there was over a thousand years of continual warfare on these islands as different factions of the English or the Welsh or the Scots or the Irish used to literally fight each other with swords and bows and arrows and then guns. And, you know, rivers and rivers of blood have gone down. I know this as a historian. And for all its, for all its failings, the United Kingdom has, has managed to prevent that for the last centuries. And from a Buddhist perspective, therefore, to, to, to want to get rid of that um, and and go into something unknown is is I think a very strange kind of thing to want to do. Um, another thing that that it might be helpful to say here um, is that I think from from a perspective of seeking enlightenment, um, everybody has to make their own choice and therefore I think it's very important this debate about Scottish independence or not should be engaged with in the most polite and respectful terms. If my friends, and I have many friends who are going to vote for Scottish independence, believing genuinely that it's going to lead to the greatest enlightenment for the Scottish people and for themselves, um, I, I, I'm, I'm duty bound to respect that choice and to engage in dialogue with them in the most friendly and generous terms I possibly can. Um, but likewise, I think other people have a duty to, to respect other people's um, seekings for enlightenment. And it's part of the beauty, actually, of our culture, is that we're in, enabled and allowed to have this debate. It's one of the beauties of, of, of British civilization that, that we stopped having civil wars. We stopped doing what they're doing in Syria. And, and, and in Israel-Palestine. And we, we, we turned it into politics. We turned it into culture and, and banter and, and comedy shows and discussion and music and songs. Um, I wrote a book about the Culture Encyclopedia of the Welsh Marches, about the border between Wales and England, which used to be littered with bodies and the great battles that used to go on for centuries. And then gradually it became a cultural zone where the Welsh tradition of poetry and music and, and song and the, the English tradition merged and blended. If you walk off as dyke, if you walk the beautiful border counties between Shropshire and Powys and so on, where I lived for 10 years, you see 
there's been a kind of symbiosis between the Welsh and English culture, and it was transmuted into a considerable degree of learning. Places like Shrewsbury became centres for culture and the arts, and education, and that was where Darwin was born, it was where many great figures of, of culture and, and poetry, like Wilfred Owen and so on, came from, and I taught at the museum in Shrewsbury for many years, and learned all this by living there. To me, that border, which was once a bloody border, then became a hope for the borders of the planet, that instead of violence, they're replaced by harmonization and and a common searching for wisdom. So figures like Sir Edward Herbert, who was the um, Earl of Montgomery Castle, the Earl of Powys, back in the 1600s, he was confronted with the choice of the English Civil War. Was he on the side of Parliament? Was he on the side of the Royalists? And ultimately he said, I'm not on anyone's side, I'm with the Kingdom of God, and I'm on the side of truth, and I'm on the side of learning. And he did a deal whereby his library was saved, and he surrendered his castle to Parliament without a fight, on condition of, of being able to ship his library out so he could move to London and carry on with his researches. Now, Edward Herbert was one of the first philosophers in Britain to search for ultimate truth beyond the particularities of different traditions. And he stands as a symbol of, of the proto-enlightenment. He was known as a deist, ultimately, and regarded as a progenitor of the Enlightenment. Um, and I think his position on, on war is similar to mine. You, you know, you do what Nagarjuna said, neither this nor that, I'm going for the kingdom of truth. And that's my position on the Scottish referendum. Um, you know, I refuse to be drawn into the war, and I, all I'm going to say is I want to ask philosophical questions about you know, the choices we're being presented with. Okay, I want to move on and talk about this from a Christian perspective, because obviously Christianity is is the most important religious tradition in these islands, in Scotland and England and Wales and Northern Ireland, and has been for many centuries. And what is Christianity? What, what would Christians have to say about this referendum? Now, I, I know that some Christian groups have... Well, some Christians have taken public sides on this. Um, there's a strong tradition, I think, in the Church of Scotland that, that seeks to support the Scottish independence lobby. Um, and I think some, some Christians have, have taken a different view. The Catholic Church and, and Pope Francis have actually, in a sense, said they, they think it would be rather sad if the United Kingdom were broken up. Um, and so the Catholic tradition, with its search for universality, I think is somewhat sceptical of nationalism. Um, but there are other Protestant churches which I think would be very sad to see the United Kingdom broken open, and would, would, would be keen to see it retained. Um, I want to go back a bit and look at the roots of Christian theology, um, because... I've done it for many years. I've taught the history of Christianity and and theology, and particularly the theology of peace. And I've been involved with interfaith groups and Christian groups and ecumenical groups. I've travelled throughout Europe, meeting theologians and engaging in dialogue with them. Um, one reflection that occurred to me recently is looking at the model of the Christian notion of the Holy Spirit and its role within the economy of of the Trinity. The majority of Christians use the notion of the Trinity as a useful language to try and make sense of ultimate reality in God, which is a mystery to all of us, of course. The, the basic Christian story is that, is that Christ, the, the, the rabbi from, from Galilee, in some way was an incarnation of the, of the Absolute. In some way he manifested that, that transcendental all in his in his life and teachings so we have the two things we have the absolute transcendental all um, and then we have a teacher walking around somehow embodying it or incarnating it and this in the Trinity is what's known as the father and the son so the father stands for that absolute unknowable transcendental but nevertheless affirmed as a being 
in the Christian school of philosophy known as personalism, the 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 impersonalism of traditions, which which reduce that all to a kind of impersonal, bland whiteness, where there's no differentiation of anything and there's just a sort of beingness, is challenged in the Christian theistic idea. There's that beingness, that all God has has a beingness which is which is personal, and therefore the label Father um, is is like to make it human, to bring it into um, an ontological zone that we can comprehend. Um, I mean, many many people nowadays prefer the notion of a goddess to God, so they talk about the Mother Goddess. Well. I would say that's implicit in the concept of, of the fatherhood of God. Um, people connect with creation, spirituality, and Matthew Fox talk about mother, father, God. I mean, that, that I'm totally comfortable with that. Jung always said the Trinity needs revising. Of course it does, but to reflect people's lived experience, and if you believe in process theology and Whitehead's vision of, of, of God's unfoldingness as a verb, if God is a verb and not a noun, then we have to be constantly updating our relationship to God. So, anyway, the point here is that there's the transcendental other, the, the, the mother-father aspect. Then there's the son, which is the, the teacher we, you know, who, who walks among us, the, the, the living sage. And then there's this thing, the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the mystery, and that's the bit I want to talk about theologically. That's the interesting bit about the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is the feminine aspect of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, and is that which binds the two other parts of the Trinity. The Father and the Son are at different poles of the universe. The one is the transcendent other, the one is the concrete manifested teacher or avatar. How on earth can they be in touch? Well, it's through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in the Bible, if you look very carefully at the text, is 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 the the mystery that binds not just the father and the son but also all that that implies it binds the invisible intangible source of all that is god whatever you want to call that goddess and and all that is tangible visible and manifest the material world my garden the loch you know my hands somehow there's a bridge built between the material visible imminent world and the transcendent other world and the bridge is this thing the holy spirit the ruach hakodesh well what on earth is that well that's the mystery and it's it's that which which brings healing and which brings peace the fruits of the holy spirit are truth and peace and justice and wisdom all the things that as Christians or as human beings we should be valuing the Holy Spirit is that which brings knowledge it's through it that teachers teach it's through it that that wise rulers rule it's through it that great artists paint and so on in the Druid context we talk about Arwen inspiration the source of divine inspiration that that inspires the great poets and bards and Druids from age to age Within each culture, there's a recognition that there is some kind of inspiration and some kind of inspirational source for all the greatest achievements that we have as, as people. You know, where did Shakespeare get his capacity for these immortal lines and stories? It was the Arwen. It was... And, and that, is, that is called in the Hellenic or, or wider European tradition, the muse. The muse is what brings inspiration and, and divine ideas into the mind of the poet or the bard or the, the seer. Now, and Homer, for instance, and Hesiod invoke these muses. And Plato, when he established his Academy of, of Wisdom in Athens, dedicated it to the nine muses, which is what I've done with the castle of the muses here in Argyle. My... my allegiance then is to that highest source of inspiration which it's possible for us humans to 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 benefit from what i think christians mean by the holy spirit is is actually the same thing but expressed in a slightly different language 
it seems to me that the Holy Spirit is, you know, all that is best in the source of of thought and life and feeling and and divine knowledge that we're capable of receiving. I mean, if you think of it like cosmic rays, if 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 God is the sum totality of the infinite universe, and, and we don't know how big it is, we don't know where it came from, it seems to be a, a whole unfolding process of many big bangs going on, infinite in size and scope and time. Yet, yet what we do know is there are these cosmic rays that go through the universe and that interpenetrate everything. As I'm speaking here, you know, I'm being suffused by this this influx of, of cosmic rays. Now, but they're invisible. I can't see them. It seems to me the Holy Spirit might be something, we might want to think of it, something akin to that, on which therefore brings messages from all other times and places. In Buddhist teachings and in theosophical teachings, the sage can tap into the alaya vijnana, the storehouse consciousness of everything that has always been. And actually tune into it. So, you know, we, we have the capacity for what's called telepathy by parapsychologists who've studied this. And lo and behold, yes, it, it, it turns out we do have this, this capacity. And that means we can feel at a distance. Now, there's something that, that is interconnecting us all. Christians call that the Holy Spirit. And they believe it's benevolent and kind and loving and good. Um... Now, it's interesting that, that in Islam, in the Sufi tradition, who are the kind of practicing mystical Muslims, you have the same idea. Ibn Arabi, in his autobiography and his writings, talks about instances of telepathy, when, when different sages and saints were communicating with him, and it's a feature of the Sufi tradition. Um, and obviously they're tapping into the same vibrational, cosmic energy field, that Christians are doing when they talk about the Holy Spirit. And Buddhists are doing when they talk about the Alaya Vijnana in the Yogacara school of Buddhism, the mind-only school, when they say, look, everything that's existing in this world exists in a kind of vibrational sea of potentiality, and it exists at the ideational level first. It exists at the pre-manifest form, what Taoists call the void. Okay, the, the, the unformed mother of all that exists, the womb if you want. Now, that's why in a sense the Ruach HaKodesh is, is the womb-like nature in which everything that exists can be mediated and cared for. Because the thing about the Holy Spirit in Christian theology is it cares for every one of us, our well-being, our sanity, our health, our money, you know, how are we coping in the physical form of being in a body? It's tough. It's difficult being, being a person, being a child, growing up, coping with emotions. We all have physical, emotional, and mental and spiritual bodies. You know, esoteric Christianity and, and all the other systems of thought divulge this. All of them have to be in harmony. Um, now, the Holy Spirit, then, is, is that which integrates and unites and brings wholeness to people's experience. When people are fractured and broken, when they feel cut off from other people or cut off from their family or their friends or cut off from different parts of themselves, they get really into a tizzy. As a teacher, I've seen kids get really upset when, let's say, their parents divorce or their family breaks up or, you know, they break up with their best friend in the playground you know, when, you're, when you talk to people and you communicate and you, you're able to navigate through the complexities of emotional ups and downs through love and stay in contact, then one could say that's when the Holy Spirit's working. It's the same with churches. Now, the, the church is, is hopeless at really reflecting what I think Christ was on about. And in my commentary on the New Testament, which I'm in the middle of, I've tried to point out that what I think Christ was actually trying to do and say and teach is different to some aspects of how the churches have, have interpreted that and what they've done with it. They've built a kind of institution 
They've built power structures, they've built big buildings and cathedrals and bishops and hierarchies and, and rituals and ceremonies. <sighs> which all of which I think is something that Christ would have found <laughs> a bit of a joke. You know, he was a radical visionary mystic who was God-infused and who was trying to get people into that state of being in, at one with the kingdom of God, being at that state of enlightenment and that place of perfect peace all the time. What I think he meant by the Christ baptismal experience, what he experienced, I think, is similar to the enlightenment experience that Buddhists and Hindus talk about. The Christ is someone who's had his, his third eye awakened, who's had his samadhi experience, who, who can then see things from that holistic perspective of awakened or active intellect. And from that place, only wants love and peace to prevail, can see the faults, the sins, the flaws that we all are full of, and yet, and yet transcend them and heal them. So, now, from a Christian perspective, the Church then, in its own way, has tried to carry that teaching forward each generation since. I think that enough evidence exists. I mean, some people say, no, there never was such a person as Jesus Christ. He didn't exist. It's a figment. There's a whole kind of cult on the internet nowadays to denigrate and deny that he even existed. Having gone into it in great depth over many years, I think that's a false argument. I think there was such a man and a teacher. Uh, and, and I think his intentions can be worked out. If you, if you frame the Gospels and the letters of Paul and the Acts and the other letters and all the apocalypses and so on, and if you put them together with the Gnostic scriptures that have come down and other references in, in, in classical literature and also in the Jewish texts, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's enough evidence that there was such a person as Christ. The, a Christian's duty then is to ask, well, what would Christ say of this situation? What kind of action would, would you know, if I'm a disciple of Christ, what, what would he say? I think the first thing he'd say is, well, you, you know, you make up your own mind. Um, but again, you do what you think would most bring healing, what would most bring reconciliation, most bring truth. Um, the fact is the United Kingdom a scattered, strange amalgam of people, but over the centuries, over the millennia, has some incredible Christian saints who've been scattered around all parts of this island, or these islands rather, and I'm including Ireland as well as Britain, Great Britain. And I'm, I'm very interested in hagiography. I've written a dictionary of saints. I've been to many pilgrimage centres throughout Wales, throughout Ireland and, and Scotland and England. And, you know, I think this is an island of, of, these are islands of saints here. They were infused with the understanding that the Holy Spirit actually does act in history, acts in time. For many years I, I have been deeply impressed by the Quaker movement and George Fox's insight that the Spirit can come just to ordinary people sitting quietly in a room, in a reverent silence. Um, I've sat for many, many, many Quaker meetings, and I can assure you that inspiration is there. Quakers find in that silence and that peace a kind of access to the Holy Spirit, which you don't need all your bells and your whistles and your incense and your psalms and your organ music. But at the same time, that is also beautiful too. And I'm a great respecter of the, the heritage of the Catholic tradition in its broadest sense, of its cathedral building and church building and, and, and its contribution to music and the arts. I think it was a great tragedy when the Puritans smashed the cathedrals and churches of Britain and destroyed all the artworks that had been created and burned the libraries. You know, there's a tremendous cultural heritage we lost as, as, as an island. I'm not convinced that John Knox... Um, in his idolatry against, um, you know, in a sense he created a kind of idol by his own hatred of, of Catholicism and his hatred of the feminine, of Mary Queen of Scots and God, she liked dancing, she liked nice clothes, you know. How, how petty and mean a man 
must John Knox have been to rail against all that and not realize that that's part of the work of the Spirit too and um, so anyway I think from from a theological perspective we have to ask what would the Holy Spirit ask us to do in this referendum what what you know do we do we keep together a country which for all its sins is an amalgam a synthesis a blending of, of many cultures many traditions many languages Celtic Anglo-Saxon Danish Viking and now a huge influx of wonderful new immigrants into our lands you know Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus and Baha'is and Jewish people and you know the, the wonderful cultural diversity you get when you live in Peckham where I lived for several years or, or any part of London now or <coughs> Southall which I know and, and Notting Hill Gate when I lived in in that part of the, of London you know are we going to affirm that as a microcosm this country is a patchwork of all these wonderful peoples in a sense a patchwork of the whole world and work out a way of living in peace and harmony bring together the greatest thinkers and traditions of of, of all these cultures into a harmony um, and help the healing of different parts of the world where they're in trouble where they're falling apart like in Israel and Palestine right now in Gaza um, or Syria can we use the wisdom that we've accumulated as a, as a culture over the last few hundred years as as our peoples went out and settled Australia New Zealand and North America and Canada and so on and travel in different parts of Africa and you know the whole history of exploration and adventure that, that our country's got. I mean I used to study at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at London University and the wealth of holdings in that library is unbelievable. You know British people, Scots, English, Welsh, whatever, mapped and went all over the world sailing in those days and, and many of them were missionaries and teachers and scholars, people like um, you know the the uh, the founder of Indo-European studies, um, who who uh, taught at um, Calcutta, and um, was interested in comparing the uh, languages of Asia and India with the languages of Europe and and Wales in particular. Um, Sir William Jones, who lived from 1746 to 1794 who was typical of the people that I studied on the marches who were Welsh but also educated in England he went to Oxford he was fluent in seven um, different languages including eventually Sanskrit as well as Latin and Greek and Hebrew and he, he realized that all these different languages come from a common root he was also a Druid who'd, who'd um, when he was working as a judge in Wales, had written a wonderful poem to, to the muse of, of the genius of, of, you know, the Druid goddess, effectively. That kind of multicultural diversity, that, that, that was, I think, why the British and the Indians got on, on the whole, pretty well. Um, and certainly when I've been back to India many times, I don't sense a great anti-British feeling. Um, there's a great love, ultimately, between our, our countries and cultures, and a recognition of, of mutual interdependence. The, the point here, from a Buddhist perspective, is this: this idea of the multiplicity of, of coexisting identities is premised on the metaphysics of codependence. Everything in reality kind of mirrors everything else, like Indra's net, and this is why the false logic of you can only be this, or you can only be that, and you have to choose. I think is a, is a, is a stupid <laughs> dumbing down of reality. Um, and, and I think from a Christian perspective, this is what the Trinity stands for. It's the complexity of that interdependence, that commingling of different realities. The Holy Spirit is the glue that binds reality together into a whole, and which makes our which makes our, our experience as, as fractured, separate beings, in which we all exist as a, as a self, nevertheless we refer back to the whole. Um, 
it gives us our ontological integrity. That's a metaphysical, a transcendental, a transpersonal integrity. It's not ultimately a national or national identity. It's, it's, it's our pluriform identity that's important. And Christians, I think, should, should first put the kingdom of God... And therefore, in a sense, we have to ask, well, you know, our identity politically is conditional to, is that country, as Thoreau said, you know, is this country serving the cause of the kingdom of peace and righteousness, or is it not? If it's not, how can we change it? How can we develop it? So, yes, Christians might want to get involved in politics, and many politicians have a Christian motivation, but I'm interested as a philosopher in asking what, you know, what would the Holy Spirit say of this choice? Now, it seems to me the Holy Spirit's actually bound our nation into one whole. And the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and, and its, its heritage over the last... Um, several millennia actually because I would say the roots of it go right back to pre-Roman times and the old Celtic tribes and the Druidical traditions that existed in both Britain and Ireland and in Britain BC Francis Pryor the great archaeologist has shown how much of how much continuity there's been in these islands actually um, and I think it's an illusion to think that history begins as 1066 and all that said you know, with the with the invasion of Julius Caesar. No, it exists in the minds of people much earlier. And we know that the great archaeological remains of Mays Howe and Orkney and the great early settlements there, which were way in advance and pioneering of many other parts of the world. And then the the Wessex culture of Stonehenge and Avebury. These people were highly sophisticated. They were capable of, of, of great art, of great jewellery, of gold work. If you go around the National Museum of Ireland, you look at the peoples of the Boyne Valley and, and New Grange, these were on a par with the most sophisticated Hellenistic Greek um, artists of, of the Mycenaean age. And in fact, the, the gold work is very, very similar to what was going on in Britain and Ireland in about 1800, 1500 BC was very, very similar to what was going on in Mycenaean Greece at the time. They were making these wonderful spiral patterns on gold leaf to be worn round the breast or, or sometimes as crowns, um, oak leaves and so on. And I think there was an absolute continuity. These people were in touch with each other, they were travelling, they were sharing skills. If you look at the Mycenaean Lion Gate, compare it to the architecture of Stonehenge, you can see parallels. The Druids were the ones who, who had the responsibility for making sure the governance, the politics, the tribal chieftains, the kings, were acting according to cosmic law, to Dharma. And if they weren't, then they had the duty to interfere and tell them so. I think the, one of the questions that Christians might want to ask, and I, I believe there's a continuity between those ancient Druids and the first Christians. Christianity came to Britain not through conquest, but through adoption by the Druid elders when they recognised in the Christian stories a kindred spirit. They saw in the story of Christ's resurrection, death, crucifixion, teachings, birth, you know, the whole narrative story. They saw a mirror of their own most heroic Druid teachings, which were all about peace and about healing, about, about reconciling, and about interdimensionality, about prophetic consciousness. You know, the Druid is also a seer uh, and a prophet, and, and, and Christ they obviously recognised as, as one such too. And so there's always been a Druidical Christian uh, narrative going on in these islands in its history right from the earliest times through to now. And in the 18th century it was in people like Yolo Morganog, and in the early times it was in the great Irish and Welsh Christian clerics and teachers, great monastic schools of the great saints of, of Wales and Ireland. Um, and then in, in 
more recent times, it's it's a kind of renaissance of Druid interest in Britain, and we have a number of orders that that some of which are teaching orders, and um, I think the the continuity is there, and I think what from a Druid Christian perspective, the 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 intervention in politics would only be if somebody is committing such acts of of wrongdoing that voices need to be spoken out against them. The the Constitution of Britain, I think, allows in its democratic checks and balances, you know, the monarch of Britain, Queen Elizabeth II, I think has done a fairly good job on the whole in quite difficult circumstances. She doesn't strike me as an unjust woman or a tyrant. Um, I've only, you know, met her indirectly at the Commonwealth Interfaith Observance, and I was very impressed by her demeanour and what I've read of her ideas and in the Queen's address and so on. She strikes me as a highly intelligent and mature woman. She is, after all, half Scottish. <laughs> and and in her, you know, ancestry, there is a lineage going right back through, you know, the Tudors, the Stuarts, the Hanoverians and right back to the old Anglo-Saxon, and the Celtic uh, monarchical lines, going right back to the old Irish uh, and Scottish and Welsh genealogies. And, and I think there's something precious in that. Now, one of my concerns about, um, if we vote for Scottish independence, and we say, okay, we want our little kingdom of Scotland, we're going to set up and go independent. I mean, I'd... <laughs> I suspect that the vast majority of people that would be voting for that option are some kind of Republican in politics, or let's be more specific, anti-monarchical. So if you, if you don't agree with the idea of having a Christian monarch in these islands as a guardian of the constitutional liberties that we enjoy, if you want a secular republic to replace that, um, then I think it, it would make sense to vote for the Scottish um, independence option. Because the chances are, whatever is said rhetorically behind the scenes, I know Alex Salmon and, and some people in the SNP have said, no, 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 of course we want to keep the crown. We'll, we'll just have like a dual monarchy. The only, so far as I know, the only time this was ever done was in Austria-Hungary, when there was a dual monarchy for a time. Um, and it didn't last. Um... um it, it, it happened, of course, prior um, to the Act of Union, um, and there was a dual monarchy. But there was also, um, you know, quite a lot of unrest and conflict and warfare in these islands. Since the Act of Union, they've, they've, they've kept as a coherent, um, by and large, uh, you know, peace-loving country. Now... If, if one says, no, well, what we want to do is, is move in the direction of a, of a republic and a secular republic, and, you know, the implication would be one would eventually abolish Christianity as any kind of important religion. You put it on a level with um, all the other religions. The, the, the logic behind that is that you, you de-Christianize the country. Um, now... People can go down that route, and you can you can have secular countries like the United States did when, when it had its own revolution, um, and it's created a total separation of church and state, and it got rid of the monarchy, and it's created the Republic of the USA. Now, in that country, religious knowledge is forbidden to be taught in schools, and what we see as a result is a tremendous flourishing of religious cults and crazy sects. Um, and also an incredible ignorance about religions. We have the foreign policy of America, um, you know, running rampage around the world. George Bush, apparently, on the eve of his invasion of Iraq, was, was told, uh, George, um, do you know there's a thing called Sunni and Shia religion, both branches of Islam, and did you know that Iraq is managing to keep these together in more or less peace, but if we go in and invade, there might be problems and civil wars blow up. And apparently George Bush didn't, hadn't even a clue there was such a distinction. You know, his own knowledge of religions was, was limited to his own personal story, as it often is with Americans. Now, what we have in Britain, for all its 
flaws. What, what the current constitutional settlement does is it enables religious education to every kid in this country um, of a degree. It, it's premised on a, a, a wide understanding of all different religions, um, but with an emphasis on the Christian heritage of these islands, which is appropriate. You know, in Japan, they teach Shinto religion. They teach Buddhism. In Britain, we should be teaching, you know, all religions, but with an emphasis on, on the Christian tradition. And I would say also on the, the, the pre-Christian, the Druid, the pagan roots of, of Britain. I think it would be far more interesting religious studies classes, and also the old runic traditions of the Anglo-Saxons and Vikings and so on. Um, so, anyway, I, I don't take that view. I don't want to live in a secular republic run by, run by politicians who, who, who are only interested in the advancement of their own party. I don't trust politicians. I've seen enough of Tony Blair's and, and, and politicians that manipulate truth like Mandelson, and that have an agenda for spin. I don't want to live in a culture where there is no higher ceiling of inquiry possible than the politician. Why, what, I, what I like about the monarchy in Britain, and I've just read an autobiog a, a biography of the Queen, which is absolutely fascinating. What it says is the Queen is important not so much because of the power she holds, but because of the fact of her holding that place, then prevents other people holding the power. So because she's, for instance, constitutionally the head of the army and the armed forces, it means we can't be taken over by a military dictator. Because she's head of the Church of, the, the, the church of England, the established church, you know, the Episcopalian church in Scotland and so on, we can't be taken over by a sort of, you know, messianic religious nutters. <laughs> um... And similarly with, with the legal system and so on, because she's technically the crown, is, is the kind of the final say of, of the justice system. So we can't be taken over by people that are 100% corrupt and, and just out for themselves, as happens in many republics. And you just look around the world, you get corrupt presidents, corrupt politicians, corrupt cabinets, and, and the whole thing lacks an ethical grounding. And you get feuds and factions between rival politicians, and, and you're in civil wars before you breathe. At least, what was found in, in British constitutional history, and this, after the traumas of the civil wars, was that by having a constitutional monarch, it keeps that, that violence from being unleashed, and it keeps that corruption and that, that evil of, of, of... Look at what's going on in Gaza, the tragedy of the evil that's being inflicted. On, on the Palestinians, and also, you know, the tragedy of the rocket firing from Hamas, um, and the stupidity of that. I mean, you know, it's a romantic notion, but wouldn't it be lovely if Israel had a king now, <laughs> um, who would who would who would be able to say, no, that's not right, what we're doing. Let's do something different. Let's try peace with the Palestinian people. Let's try peacemaking. Let's let's try actually listening to their demands. They're not too tragic. What they want is a port, an airport, you know, somewhere to live. They need their electricity back on. So this this is the kind of Christian hope that 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 there is some kind of justice at the heart of existence that is a bottom line, which is there to provide that succor. That's what a wise king or queen does. And it seems to me, for all her limitations the the queen is an excellent queen and, and we should keep her so i'm i'm afraid and i i would have thought christians throughout britain should think very carefully about voting for a system which is ultimately going to lead to a secular republic coming into being because i think for all the rhetoric of the scottish nationalists that's ultimately the long-term agenda and most people that i've spoken to or discussed this with who are some kind of scottish nationalist would actually say yes that's the long-term game plan but we're not saying that in public because you know that might turn off the average voter well i think that's dishonest i mean if that's what you want you should say it if you want a scottish secular national republic then be open give people the choice i think that's a, a, a foolish um, direction to be pursuing and um, i think it's also anti-christian in its in its long-term implications well, so what, says, says somebody. Well, I, I have a, a, somebody who I have this debate with um, 
while ago, and I made the argument that voting for the United Kingdom and keeping it together is, is, a, is a more Christian kind of uh, position than to break it up and to go in the direction of the Second Republic. And this chap said, well, so what? Yes, it's, um, I, mean, I mean, it is anti-Christian because, you know, it, yes, it's taking the Judas position, actually, um, was the comment I got. And the reason the comment was made is because, well, I don't like Christ. I'm not with Christians. I, I think Judas was a very good man and was totally right to shop Jesus. Look, he got above his station. He was teaching and preaching. You know, of course he should have been crucified. He was a rabble maker, a troublemaker. I'm with Judas. Okay, so I'm afraid I'm not. You know, my dear friend who's with Judas is a very convinced um, Scottish nationalist campaigning to break up the United Kingdom and believes that in doing so he's, he's casting a blow against Christianity and for Judas. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I can't support that. Um, you know, I think that, that the United Kingdom is worth preserving and I also think Christianity not only hasn't yet finished its work but still has a lot of work to do in the world. Look at the tragedy of the Christians of Mosul who are being forced from their homes by the Syrian Islamic fundamentalists who are telling them to convert to Islam, face a huge tax, or be killed. And what about the Islamic State armies of Mosul rounding up young women and forcibly giving them clitorectomies because that's their belief is the Islamic law, which of course it isn't their own level of knowledge of Islam is so little that they think that. Um, or staining to death two women for accusations of adultery. You know, Christians throughout um, the Middle East and throughout the world are actually suffering enormous persecution at the moment um, throughout the world, and there are a number of studies that have come out recently. I don't think now is the time to be attacking Christianity in our own home base. Scotland is one of the most important countries on the Christian map, and it was here the ecumenical movement was born. Um, the Church of Scotland has a great compassion and outreach for peace and development, and, you know, I know and love the Isle of Iona very well, and the work that the Iona community does. Um, it seems to me the question we should ask from a Christian perspective is, does the United Kingdom provide a, a, a viable and useful outreach service on behalf of Christianity around the world. I would say it does. Look at the development aid that the UK is giving, um, and which is ring-fenced and continues to be given, but it's hopefully being given more intelligently, so it doesn't end up in the hands of corrupt people. What I would like to see is a, a really intelligent Christian peace policy in Britain, which is about healing and helping people in conflict around the world. Solidarity with the Christians, for instance, of Gaza, um, who are being mercilessly attacked and bombed as we speak. In my own view, the Commonwealth could, could welcome Palestine into membership and help rebuild the infrastructure of that tragically shattered and torn country, build a railway between Gaza and, and, and uh, the West Bank and so on. I think this is a debt owed by the Commonwealth to the people of Palestine. And after all, Christ himself was a Palestinian. And I've been to Bethlehem, I've been to Galilee, I've been around different parts of Israel and Palestine. And I do believe it's possible to reach peace between Israel and Palestine. And I think Britain, the United Kingdom as a whole, still has a role to play in that. Um, and, and, you know, the, the Church of Scotland has a great centre in, in Galilee and in Tiberias. And... I think all the churches of Britain and Ireland can still be a voice for peace and sanity in the world. And I, I, I love the idea of nuclear disarmament, and I think the church should be pushing for this. Um, and it should come through the establishment of structures and reconciliations between cultures and peoples, through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the work of focused intelligence that creates institutions of of viable sustainability and then the need for weapons fall away because we replace violence through dialogue and politics and and listening 
Okay, um, I, I, I'm going to move on and, and talk. I've already talked a bit about the pagan and druid perspective on on politics, and I want to just say a little bit more about that. There are many pagans in Britain today. There are many druids in both Britain and all over Ireland, and I've met many of them. Some of them are very wonderful people and highly learned. Um, I was friends with a number of them, um, figures such as the founder of the Fellowship of Isis in Ireland at Clonagall Castle was a friend of mine, Reverend Durden Robertson, a great historian who first told me about um, Geoffrey Keating's wonderful History of Ireland. And it carries the stories of the ancient Irish um, legends going right back to Druid times. I'm quarter Irish myself and have a great love for the whole Druid and pagan history of, of, of these islands, but also in the wider context of Europe as a whole. And I've given um, a scholarship by the Mount Hemus uh, scholarship from the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, of which I'm a member, and wrote a book about the history of Druidry, um, looking at that from a transpersonal perspective, and gave a lecture at Salisbury a couple of years ago. And my interest in Druidry is because here we have the ancient wisdom tradition of, of Britain and Ireland, and it was fundamentally about peace. It was fundamentally about truth and justice. The word Druid and the word Dharma come from the same root. My earlier interests in Buddhism were discovered simultaneously to my interest in, in, in Druidry because I discovered that the word Dharma and the word druid come from the same root. It's that which is permanently enduring. Um, and it, it's there in the oak of the forest, the oldest tree, a thousand years it's been around or more. And so the, the dharma is that which is constant and doesn't change. On the island of Paris, the Ile de la Cité, there's a spot where the Grand Master of the... Um, a temple at Jacques de Molay was burned after a fake trial. And when I went around the Vatican recently, I went to the exhibition of, of the secret archives of the Vatican. Now, they had the roll on which the Templar order had been um, grilled under torture. And, and this was the scroll where the Inquisition actually wrote down their so-called confessions. Now, I think their confessions were trumped up, and that the Templars... What, what their crime was, was to be able to think outside the box and by their presence in the Holy Land, by meeting Sufis, by meeting Islamic philosophers and sages, by meeting Jews and so on, rabbis, they'd, they'd come to hold a deeper, bigger picture um, than your average parish priest or petty prelate back in Europe. They'd recognised the, the, the breadth of thinking that was there in in their adversaries in Islam. And so they'd, in a sense, they'd, they'd tried to develop this idea of a transcendental order which could work for peace beyond the, the barricades. And I think there were mystical exchanges which they'd had with some of the great Sufi orders. And so the Templars then became a threat to the established, more orthodox, kind of narrow-minded Christians back in Europe, and that's why they were tortured and, and killed. And when Jacques de Molay went up in flames, he said, you know, a few curses on, on those who were doing it. But just near there are the halls of justice, the Palais de Justice for the French state. Basically, they're, they're courts, they're, they're sort of royal courts, so to speak. And there's a plaque on the wall that says, Tempus Fugit stat use. Time flies, but justice remains. And I think that is what the Druid position is, is that time flies, centuries come and go, decades come and go, lives flash past again and again, but justice remains. Now that's what Dharma is, it's the eternal verity, the truth, that the Druid's job is to see and to discern in given epochs, cycles, situations, and contexts. And I'm, I'm, currently I serve as the peace officer of the Council of British Druid Orders, so I, I didn't really know there were any existing Druid Orders until 
a couple of decades ago when a friend of mine introduced me to the Council of British Druid Orders, and it's a scattered group of, of Druid groups that, that exist throughout Britain and Ireland, and I think all of us in our own ways try to discern that ultimate truth behind behind the passing phenomena of, of existence and try to um, to uphold truth and justice as much as possible. Um, there are Druids also scattered throughout other parts of the world and my own interest is seeing the peace witness of the Druids brought back. But that was very much about resolving the conflict at root. Um, we've seen in the televised version of Merlin and the other Arthurian um, media stories and the whole Arthurian cycles that go back to medieval literature and were very important. The Merlin figure is the character at the court of the king who advises him and provides solutions that are conducive to justice. From a Druid perspective then, why would one want to break up the United Kingdom? Has, has the crown committed you know, is, are we ruled by an unjust monarch? No. Um, are we ruled by unjust governments? Well, they keep changing, and I would say we have quite a lot of governments, actually. We have different levels of government. Um, we have local governments, we have now national governments, we have a United Kingdom government. We then have a European level of government. From a Druid perspective, I'd say we have too many. Reduce the burden. They're all living off taxpayers. I'd say less government, not more. Um, do we want to create a whole new state that then brings in new taxes and new laws and, and has new powers? Hmm, I, I would need convincing on that. Um, I'd say get rid of even some of the ones we have rather than, than, than add to the burden. Do politicians as a whole, as a class, speak the truth? Are they conducive to justice and righteousness? I'm not sure. A lot of them seem to be rather corrupt. A lot of them seem to be some kind of paedophile or, or megalomaniac figures who, who go around creating wars. I'd say it's time for the politicians to have less say in what we do as people. Um, you know, they're always abolishing things that give little people pleasure, like, I don't know, going down the pub and, and having a smoke and a pint. No, that's illegal. You can't even take out a guitar and start singing a song anymore. That's illegal. Everywhere we're governed by people with clipboards bringing rules and regulations to determine every little detail of our lives and charging us for the pleasure. They're not druidical. These people are, are, are not working according to dharma and righteousness. They're working according to legalism, which is contrary to the spirit of true dharma and true enlightenment. And my concern about creating another layer of nation-stateness, a whole new layer of officials and bureaucrats and civil servants, and people with the power to punish and, 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 and regulate, is that it's simply jobs for the bureaucrats, it's simply jobs for the, the professional classes. Now, Alex Salmond is, by definition, the archetypal bureaucrat. He was working for the Scottish office. He's, he's never known life outside politics and bureaucracy. Um, and, and all the people that work with him, and, you know, it just seems to be creating a new nexus of bureaucratization which can oppress ordinary people. Um, from a Druid perspective, it's, it's a complete nonsense. It's a nightmare. And, and why on earth would we empower the creation of a whole new secular-oriented um, you know, power nexus that's going to simply tax, oppress, regulate, and, and govern people. What we should be working towards is self-government, autarky, enlightenment, education systems that actually deliver wisdom to people rather than just technocracy. We should be empowering people with the freedom to make their own moral choices and decide whether they want to smoke or not, or or whatever, um, within reason and within cosmic law. So I think, from also from a pagan perspective and a Druid perspective, I think it, it's this country is one of the few that actually gives recognition and a degree of religious freedom and autonomy to people in the 
MAD now, there are Druids and, and pagans who are actively, you know, free to worship in the prison service. There are people now working as chaplains and, and um, prison visitors from the pagan and Druid community. Um, in the interfaith community, the, the voices of pagans and Druids has, has become clearer. And in education too, some education authorities have begun to look at the pagan heritage of Britain and realise that there's something here worth worth teaching. And in the Cornish um, Sacre recently, that the provision of education about paganism was made, you know, mandatory, and, and the same in other places, in Oxfordshire, and, and I think it should be, you know, throughout the whole of the United Kingdom, something to be celebrated. The ancient uh, wisdom of the ancestors, um, and above all, I think that perspective is it's brought to bear we'll see that these islands are a kind of unity that belong together. Um, at Stonehenge, they found offerings and evidence that people travelled to ritual festivals at Stonehenge from as far as Orkney and far north of Scotland and from Ireland. <coughs> I think the ancient Druids used to travel freely throughout the whole British Isles, teaching, learning, serving, healing. And I think it would be dreadful to create new boundaries and borders where you get stopped and passports are demanded and officials in uniform look at your visas and so on. Why on earth do we want to create more borders and more boundaries and more officials taxing people to prevent their free movement? One of the beauties of the United Kingdom is we have a union um, in which we can all move about and enjoy each other's company from... Land's End to John O'Groats to Kent to County Down. You know, long may it last. Um, that's, I think, you know, several of the arguments that a Druid might, might want to put forward. And certainly, my last word on this, as Druid Peace Officer to the Council, and as the Archdruid of a, a, a Peace Order of Druids, I think any actions that might lead to the possibility of violence, not tomorrow, not next year, but a hundred years or five hundred years from now, looking down the line, is one not to be taken. I'm, I'm concerned as a Druid with very, very long time cycles. I'm, I'm concerned with thousands of years. That's, that's my job as an ovate, to see consequences of actions we take now, how they may, may resonate and ripple down the millennia, not just the centuries. And if we break up a structure that has existed for half a millennia and we move in the direction of you know, creating two entirely different nation-states here, we are, we are running the risk of an eventual situation might arise where country X decides it's going to go to war with country Z uh, because of whatever, and and you know, country W, its neighbour, decides not only is it going to side with the other lot, but it's going to attack them. So, I mean, imagine World War One or World War Two if Scotland had been completely independent, and would it have necessarily sided with, with England, Scotland and Wales? Would it have sided with Germany? We don't know. Um, but and certainly there were voices in Scotland that were quite pro-German, um, and it might have been neutral. You don't know. Um, from a, So, in the next 500 years, if Scotland becomes utterly and totally independent, and, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that one might look forward in the future to some resumption of hostilities. Um, and as peace steward of the whole of Britain... Scotland, Wales, Ireland, etc., <clears throat> Northern Ireland, and Cornwall, and you know wherever. My duty is to warn people of that prospect in the long term. You can say, "Well, that's just ridiculous. That's fantasy." Of course, the Scots are really peace-loving people. The English are loving, and you know there'll be a separation, an amical divorce, and everyone will live happily ever after, like in Czechoslovakia. 
Okay, but so far as I know, the Czechs and the Slovaks don't have a long history of conflict prior to their union, whereas the Scots and the English did. And for all that's said about there not being any anti-English rhetoric involved in this, I certainly have heard quite a lot of anti-English rhetoric coming from the Scots nationalists. I've heard quite a lot of anti-English, um, you know, sentiments and arguments. And my concern is that long term, it could lead to resumptions of hostilities. And like I say, any time in the next millennium is, it's not a risk worth taking. If we have a structure that keeps all that in place, if it, if it moderates people's nationalist antipathies to one another to football match, you know, argy-bargy, that's a good thing. If we want to destroy the structure that's keeping that um, at bay, we, we enter the possibility of the Yugoslav um, route. Now, Yugoslavia was, was a complex, multicultural patchwork of different nations which were kept together through an act of faith and will. And on the whole, it worked. Yugoslavia was an amazing country. I traveled there in the 80s before it all blew up. And I studied its history as part of my degree at the University of London. And my uncle was working in the SAS in World War II, helping Tito's partisans. Um, you know, Yugoslavia was an ally of Britain and an amazing culture. I think Douglas Hare was sleeping on the job when he let it be broken up. And what should have happened, it should have come into the European Union as one thing, rather than allowing it to break up. What we saw then was an endless succession of conflicts um, and horrendous scenes as the different parts of Yugoslavia blew apart and blew into conflict. And now anybody thinking about it would have said, no, that's never going to happen. Yeah, we might split up, but we're always going to love each other. But no, it happened on, on the doorsteps of... Of, of Western Europe just, you know, a few years ago. And I've met people who lived through the sieges of Sarajevo, people from Bosnia and people from Serbia, Slovenia. You know, I've met and talked to these people. I'm something of an expert on Yugoslav history and received a prize for it at the University of London. And I can only counsel from the Yugoslav perspective that you should break up a nation state with extreme, extreme caution. There were nationalist voices in Yugoslavia saying, no, let's, let's break it all up. Let's have Croatia for Croatians. Let's have Slovenia for Slovenians. Let's have Serbia for Serbians. And it caused absolute mayhem, bloodshed, and a drop in living standards, and a drop in cultural and scientific achievements. And, you know, it's never been the same since. Um, if everybody I've spoken to, I think with one or two exceptions, said if we could have a time machine we would switch back the clock and not break up Yugoslavia. It was the worst mistake we ever made. Yes, we had differences, we had different cultures, we could have we could have sort them, sorted them out through jigging the constitution, etc, etc. We could have had a greater degree of federalism. What we shouldn't have done is break up into separate nation states because nation states are allowed in international law to go to war with each other and that's what they did. And then, of course, it becomes complex because, because cross-border identities then come into play and, you know, before you know, you've got a maelstrom going on. If I see, as a Druid, any possibility of that happening in the breakup of the United Kingdom, then I have morally to counsel against that. And I'm afraid I do. Anyone, I think, that looks at the history of these islands over the last 2,000 years would have to come to the conclusion it's a risk. It may be a slight risk but it's still a risk. And if you want to walk close to the edge of the cliffs of Moha in a force 10 Atlantic gale, there's a risk you might blow off. And I think as a Druid, I have a duty to warn people of that risk and, um, you know, mark my words. And this is why one of the reasons I would say as a doctor, because Druids are also healers, um, you know, if, if you're going in for very expensive surgery, the doctor has a duty to say, look, you know, there's a 50-50% here, this might result in your death. Not tomorrow, not the day after, but eventually. Um, and I think if you were on the eve of the breakup of Yugoslavia, um, and you'd asked their equivalent of a druid, you know, is this a good idea? 
they might have said something similar. Unfortunately, those voices were not heard. Instead, what you got was religious fanatics all egging on the nationalist option. I'm sure I know there were people of wisdom, and their voice was not heard. Um, it was in Struga, the poetry festival at Ochrid, Lake Ochrid, that I've been to several times. I met people from throughout the former Yugoslavia who told me with tears in their eyes that I wish, wish, wish we'd spoken out more and, and never let it happen. You know, our country's been destroyed. Well, that's why I'm speaking out now. And for those reasons, both as a poet and a seer and a druid, I have a duty to counsel caution. I don't want to go down the Yugoslav option.